The following program is a UW-TV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection, I'm Marsha Alvar. The Concubine's Children is a new book that traces more than 70 years in the life of a single family living in two different worlds. As she moves between a small village in southern China and the crowded streets of Vancouver's Chinatown, author and economist Denise Chong blends social and political history with her family's photographs, letters, and memories. She tells the story of Chinese immigration to the New World and the life of those left behind, but not forgotten in the old. Chong's quest for her family's full story would ultimately lead from recollection to reunion. Welcome to Upon Reflection. When did you first realize that your family's story was incomplete, that you didn't know everything about your family? Well, I knew that there had to be a difference between some black and white photographs that existed of my family's past that were in the in the, the bottom drawer of the cedar chest in my parents' bedroom upstairs, which were beautiful black and white photographs that seemed to speak of pride. And then, in contrast, there was the life of my grandmother in a rooming house in Chinatown. Um, when she died, she died in a car accident. It seemed to guillotine the past, and with it, we want, my, it seemed my mother wanted to bury that past. My mother had to go to the police station to claim my grandmother's personal effects. All there was was a tobacco tin of coins and a pawn shop receipt. That verdict on the past seemed to be so harsh, my mother seemed to want to shut the door on it. So I knew there had to be something to explain what had gone so wrong. In reading your book, I have this image of you as a young girl going through this cedar drawer, looking at the pictures, having questions about them. When you'd ask your mother, who's this, or it looks like something's been cut away from this picture, mm -hmm. what would your mother say? We'd sit at the kitchen table, and um, I'd ask my mother what it was like when she was a girl, because I was a girl of five or six, and, and I think as a child, all, all you're interested in is, is, is my mother was a girl too, and is she the girl that I am? So I asked her mainly about, um, I, I wanted to remember when she laughed as a child, and when she, but she, it seemed that all she told me was when she cried. Then I'd look at the pictures, and I, I never really asked my mother about those pictures. I thought I went in secret to that cedar chest. And, and uh, she was so somber and so sad and confused looking in these portraits of her as a child. So my mother's stories had me mesmerized. They were stories of a world far removed from me. You know, we, we'd play in our bicycles and, and play, we'd take our bikes down the country lane and wander in the fields. My mother told me stories of back alleys of Chinatown, dark, dingy rooming houses. She'd, she'd wait for her mother uh, to, to come home from the gambling parlor, or when she just didn't come home, my mother would go there looking for her and be shoved off to the side because her mother just couldn't walk away from the mahjong table. Mm -hmm. So I had all those stories that as a child, that this was my mother's girlhood. And then eventually, I too laid those stories to rest. Although I, my curiosity about what, ex, what could account for all that probably never left me. Hmm. The story of your family is set in the, in the larger context of the immigration of people from China to North America, to the United States and to Canada, where your family lived. Talk about when the first great wave of immigration began and, and what drew people from China to North America? The Chinese knew of North America as Gold Mountain because the first um, whispers of gold came when, when gold was struck in Sacramento and this would be in, in 1842. So the Chinese, there was a race on for gold across the Pacific and the south of China Canton was the only port open to foreigners for, 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 for the longest time. So in that little province of, of Guangdong, there was a sense that 
that um, of adventure across the ocean. These were the seafaring people. These were the people who went abroad were, fo were some of the folk heroes. So the race was on for gold. After that wave came th the railroad building. When um, North American governments, they tried first to hire whites, and they were mainly Irish, who wouldn't stay on the job. So then they turned to importing cheap labor, which was the Chinese. My grandfather comes even after that era. By this time, by the time the railroads were finished and, and the last of the gold had run out, the Chinese had begun to set down some routes, and then you get the first Chinatowns. The governments in both Canada and the United States reacted to the, some fanatical lobbying up and down the West Coast that the Chinese, my, my goodness, the Chinese were going to settle here. They're an alien race. This They're was the horde. Yes, that was the yellow in great peril. Yes, and, and that, that this depraved, disease-ridden, alien race would settle here. Let's keep these hordes out. So there were, the laws were very re more and more restrictive against incoming Chinese. And in fact, in 1882, in, in the United States, there was actually the Americans a stop. would bring in the historic exclusion act, which just slammed the door. So the only door open to, to, to Gold Mountain, therefore, was Canada's. It, at the turn of the century, China was like a teapot, pouring out men like my grandfather. He was poor, he was a peasant, he lived in a dusty village in South China. But South China was overrun by, by rival warlords. And whole families would form thieving gangs because banditry was the only secure livelihood. My grandfather borrowed money, came abroad to try and earn a living, and he left his wife at home in the dignity of the family home on the soil. And that's one branch of this two-branched family. Yes. In addition to the at-home wife in China, there is the concubine of the title of this book. Right. Tell me about the concubine, well, the role of the concubine. Well, my grandfather was very lonely in Canada. And the laws by this time in Canada had followed suit, like the United States, the door was slammed shut. And we should mention there's a lot more men Chinese men in North America yes. than there are women. On the street, you would easily see 25 to 1 men to women. The ratio was probably at the time of my, my um, grandmother, grandfather took a concubine in 1924, the ratio might have been 10 to 1. But on the street, it was much higher because respectable women were kept behind the four walls of a flat you know, under which the merchant had his shop. My grandfather was lonely. He purchased a concubine from China. A man's wife is chosen by his parents. A man chooses his own concubine, often from a face in a brothel. So it's a disgrace to be a concubine. My grandmother was already sold once as a child. It was when families were poor enough, they, they sold their daughters like tea. So my grandmother was sold at age four. At age 17, she was sold again to be a concubine to a man. A continent away. It's a, one of those great contradictions that it's a it's a disgrace to be a concubine, but it's no disgrace to have a concubine. That's right. It, it only gives the man prestige. We have some pictures, so we can put faces to uh, to some of the the people that you've talked about so far. And these are are photographs taken from the book. Your grandfather. My grandfather sits there very proudly, but but he sits with all the props of a gentleman. He has a he has a book folded under the, on the table, he has a clock, he has a, a chrysanthemum plant. He, he, that, those are the props of a gentleman, which belie his peasant background. But he was very, he wanted very much to be a gentleman. He was very interested in appearances. Yes, appearances were everything, which, which was the code of Chinatown at the time. This is the concubine. This is my grandmother, although it's some years later after my uh, grandfather takes her as a concubine. At this point, she, she, she's actually separated from my grandfather, and this is a picture she, she posed with, with her lover, a it's gambler operator. The careful scissoring around the picture. Yes, and gone from the picture is her lover who once stood behind her. She was quite a remarkable woman. Now, my grandmother would arrive in, in Chinatown to meet the man she'd been sold to, only to discover that she too would walk these streets of Vancouver's Chinatown because my grandfather couldn't afford to have a concubine, and he indented her as a tea house waitress. <laughs>
So she'd be going back and forth to the dim sum houses to and from work. Now this is the at-home wife. This is the at-home wife in front of the house that my grandfather would come to build in China. And you can see the doorway is many times the average person's height. <laughs> so it, it's the landmark of the village. The at-home wife is the, the smaller woman on the right. And she would, she would bear my grandfather a son who stands in the middle. And that would be my, the son's wife and children. The concubine would fail to deliver any sons. The wife at home. Your grandmother wife at home would be, deliver the son. And there's your mother as a young girl. My mother is walking the streets of Chinatown in Vancouver. She's, she's walking with her, her brother, who's, whose name was Leonard. The concubine had delivered no sons of her own. So upset was she that she didn't have the pleasure upon looking upon a son that she would actually purchase that boy, Leonard, when he was a newborn. And in that picture, we can't see it very clearly, but your mother is wearing a coat that many years later would, uh, would come back to her. Yes, that is a brown knit coat with a, a, blue, a boucle collar. My mother received that as a gift from her, her, grandma, her mother. She, she bought it from some fashionable store in Chinatown. It was one of the few extravagances my mother had known. Some 50 years later, we would find that same coat in China where my mother's blood sisters who had been born to the concubine but ended up trapped in China would inherit that coat. It would be passed on, kept away from Japanese soldiers, from communist vigilantes, stored in a storeroom in the upstairs room of my grandfather's house along with the hope that one day this sister, my mother, would meet her flesh and blood siblings and come home and they would present this coat to her. So you mentioned she had two sisters, one who survives still, and a brother. Yes. She hadn't seen them from the time, she had never really seen them. She had never met them. All my mother knew of them was a black and white picture that stood on my grandmother's dresser and, and it would have been, it'd been in a cardboard frame and then you know, when the cardboard frame game gave out, that picture was tucked into the, the glass of, of the mirror. Was she, in the mid-1980s, when you were in China, and you proposed this idea to your mother of seeing if she could find these, these long-lost uh, sister and brother, what did she think about the idea? There had been no contact for so long. My mother had never actually set eyes on her siblings. She didn't know what it was like even to have siblings. So at first I didn't know that, that, I didn't expect to find anybody alive. All I thought was that we were going to the village to stand on the soil where my grandfather once stood. I had no hope of finding any living relatives. So, but still, a visit to persuade my mother to come meant she had to brave her feelings about the past. And my mother had always, I think, tried to think the past had been buried. My grandparents were in the grave. It was, you know, 20 years since my grandmother had gone to the grave, 30 since my grandfather had been laid to rest. My mother thought the past had turned to ashes. So for me to ask her to come to China was to say, to say, all right, we're going to step over that threshold. But also just the term China evoked in her some mixture of fear and confusion because to her, China was 1949. The communists have come in, her father comes to her and says, we're cutting off communication with the family at home. I fear that the, the communists are intercepting mail, that maybe they're extorting money from me. So my mother has that, associates that with China. I would think there would also be resentment. I mean, here, after all, here's your mother, a young girl who really was left to fend for herself a good deal. Her mother, your grandmother, out earning the money that your grandfather would send back to the at-home wife and that family in China. My mother as a child knew only rooming houses, gambling parlors, the path to and from the pawn shop. When she was a child, she remembered that her grandfather had gone to China to build a house. My mother didn't know what a house was. I mean, she, she bought blocks from a toy shop that, that you could construct a little Chinese house with, but she had no idea of, of what, what her father had really gone to build. She had no idea of really what her grandmother's waitressing wages, which were paltry 
And the tips that went back to China, she didn't really know that they'd gone to, to individually sand bricks to hire workmen to, to lime wash the walls. She didn't know that. Not until we stepped into the village in China and we meet my mother's siblings, we walk down the narrow path, and suddenly, before my mother, is this two-story house of many rooms. And then my mother, I think, whatever bitterness had welled up in her from her past, she knows it's about to be explained in this monument of a house. When you got to China, and the, the two branches of the, of the tree actually came together, there are also two very different mythologies about the past. Yes. Each branch of the family had its own version yes. of what the main players had been like. Talk about the two. And each is a truth. My, my mother knew about the shame of her past because a waitress is at the bottom of, of the social hierarchy. A waitress was like, a waitress was, had, the sa had the same reputation as a prostitute. You were, you were both there to woo men to spend money. My mother had the disgrace of translating for her mother at the pawn shop. My mother always felt, her stories to me always ended, I had nobody. That was my mother's life. We go to China. There is the family. There's the close-knit family of the siblings who held together, hoping that one day the family would be under the same roof. There in the storeroom upstairs are possessions from Gold Mountain, an RCA Victor phonograph, a, an old pram, a crib, a, a, an alarm clock. On, in the front room of my grandfather's house is this large regulator clock still working that says, says on the face of it, made in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. So there are all the, the relics from Gold Mountain are there. So for the pro, on the one hand, there's the sh my mother's shame, there's the pride in China. So things would come and make a hole again. But the family in China, yes, had a different version of events. They, to them, it was my grandfather who built the house. It was the concubine who, as his letters home said, she was cranky, she gambles, she can't walk away from the mahjong she's table. She's too independent. She drinks. <laughs> my grandfather wrote, she's more like a man than a woman. <laughs> and to them, that was their condemnation of the concubine. It but wasn't that she had actually paid for all of the bricks that built no, the house. No, to them it was my grandfather's sacrifice. They didn't know that my grandfather, in fact, had come to collect that money from my grandmother. The family in China went through some very harrowing mm -hmm. times, uh, particularly during the, the Cultural Revolution and the great reform mm -hmm. uh, that went on. There is a story of, of the at-home wife chopping meat, heard by the neighbors, uh, yes. who then accused her and said, you must be very well off, and, and hiding then afterwards in the interior of the house to cut any meat so that the neighbors wouldn't know about it. How did you get them to tell these stories? Was it hard, or did they, did they very willingly tell you? Well, within the four walls of my grandfather's house and under his portrait, alongside of which was the portrait of the at-home wife. This is where the story spilled, you know, over the acrid smoke of the, the tablet to keep away the mosquitoes. This was their truth. And they viewed my mother as having come home to reclaim the fa family history. They viewed her as coming to hear them. They, they were not there to hear her version. They were, to, they were there to let her reclaim the history of the family at home. So they willingly poured out their stories over the years. And they had so little to cling on to about a sense of family that these stories of their past were so close to them that they even would dream of them. They told them to each other over and over they, to preserve what little sense of family they had against the adversity of lost contact, persecution, confiscation of their goods, the division of the house. But it was lovely. There, there's a moment when you're, you're all together in China visiting where you, you were. It comes clear to you that, that the two views are very different. Mm -hmm. They're both true. Mm -hmm. There's no point in arguing them. No, because I realized that their truth in China was very fragile. It had to survive so much punishment and vindictiveness of a regime because my grandfather was so had such a penchant for showiness mm 
but not the means to afford it, his family had paid the price had of it. Had become targets. Yes, they'd been. So that truth was a very fragile truth that they, hang, they hung on to, and it had sustained them, given them reason to carry on. And I didn't want to just, I didn't want to, to fracture it. This is the story of your family. How many other families is this also the story for? I think there are many in America who have Chinese Americans or Chinese Canadians who have lost their family histories, who don't have a chance to reclaim them. And I think that through, through my story, they can live a little bit of what might have been come, might have, might, might have become of their lost families. Because the, the, the idea of the concubine was not really very unusual. There no. were many concubines and many, uh, many at-home families, wives yes. and children. And, and in the history of immigration, when you talked about the restrictions, I look at this book and, and I, what I see is a series of strandings. I mean, people would be here, they couldn't yes. get there, they'd be there, they couldn't yes. get here. Uh, and so it, it would probably be very natural that this would be a, an un, not at all uncommon. Well, what I realized, came to realize, is that the forces of history, which in my grandparents' case buffeted them on both sides of the ocean, there was the, there was the, the chaos of South China and the Civil War and, the, and, the, and the, um, the, the, the corrupt policies of the nationalist government. On the other side, there were the discriminatory laws of, the, of, of Canada and America, the inhospitality bitterness of where they had, they, where they were stuck. But how you deal with history depends so much on temperament. And my grandfather, others had the strength to say, look, we can't get back to China. We've lost our relatives. We have to set down roads. My grandfather had the folly to say, one can only hope that things change for the better in China. This is how he would end his letters home. And then when things got really desperate, you know, when the communists came in, he'd end his letters by saying, one can only hope one lives to an old age. But yes, it was my grandfather's folly that allowed the family sinews to stay strong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, history does depend on temperament, too. There is now a, a whole new wave of immigration yes. from China. How different from your grandparents' experience? Chinatown is disappearing. It's, it's a historical term now. The people who once lived it. It's a tourist attraction it, yes, for a lot of people. Yes, the people who once, it was their, their life and blood community, you know, where the saying was, where there's a worm, there's a leaf to help. Now, you're right, it's, the, it's gone the way of the souvenir shop, the curio shop, because the new wave of immigration from Hong Kong, mostly, is bypassing Chinatown. Those aren't their roots. They, they want to settle in the flourishing suburbs. They're, they're an educated, moneyed class. So I did feel, as I researched the book, that I was just rescuing a story from, from the debris of history, and that I was you know, recreating those Chinatowns before they really did just slip away. I was thinking of the, of the new immigrants, and it, one doesn't want to romanticize poverty that's been enforced on a group of people True. from the from the larger culture. But I think of your mother who really was on her own for so much of her life in the Chinatown of both Vancouver and in Nanaimo where the family also lived and wondered now could a child have that same kind of community support be able to wander around so much on her own and always know that there would be someone there to help. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a catch-22 situation at the time because the more the Chinese kept to themselves, the more they were excluded from the, other, the white society. The more they were excluded, the more they kept to themselves. And the society was so distorted at the time where there were so few children because of the laws, because women and weren't coming here, wives weren't allowed, the, the, the birth rate could only would, would be the only reason that the Chinatown's would, population would start to grow again. So children were cherished, oddly enough. Here my mother is a girl, and sons are revered, and yet my mother was cherished by the old-timers around there because they, they so missed their families left behind. Hmm. What, what did you learn in researching the history of your people that you'd never known before? that surprised you, that changed the way that you looked at, at your own past? I, I didn't know all the details of the, 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 the burden of the laws. 
and the discriminatory practices. I, you know, I didn't know until my mother told me that um, she left high school because her high school principal said to her, you know, graduation will not improve your chances at getting a job because he, and he told her the word prejudice. So I, I didn't know those details. I, by learning them, telling them to my mother, she has a realization of what it was she was fighting against and, and things that even her mother didn't understand. And, and, but at the same time, my mother still dreamed and her mother still dreamed of a better life and, and securing a better foothold. And those dreams were realized a generation later. And were it not for the, in this kind of more enlightened society, I would be like my cousins in the village who are tied to the land, who still have their, their mates chosen for them, their husbands are, are arranged, their marriages are arranged, who, have, who don't have the chances of education. And who still dream of who, going to Gold They Mount. still dream, yes, that there must be, you know, the next valley must be where there's a better life. As you said, your, your grandparents are both dead. As you did this book, were there questions you wished you could still ask them, the mysteries about the two of them that, that you will never be able to unravel? I feel when I, when I finished the book, I felt that though my grandparents are in the grave, and I, I, knew, them, well, I knew them for a short time when they, before they both passed on, but, but they terrif my grandmother terrified me when I was a child. You didn't get along real well. No. <laughs> I could hardly swallow in her presence. But I felt like I made peace with them. I felt like I'd found, I knew the bad of their life, I'd found the good. I knew the shame, I'd restored the pride. But it doesn't mean that the family history and the family stories are, are, are all answered. You're right, there still is the confusion. They still keep some privacy with them in the grave. I haven't lost it all for them. But in making a peace with them, it's lighten my mother's own burden of the past. And I think if she, it doesn't, it means I'm not carrying forward a burden of the past. Hmm. So it's, a, it's kind of a circle. It's a, a continuum. And a healing. Yes, I think so. And I think it makes a difference when my daughter one day and my son will read the book. They'll understand that we had the past, we gathered the pieces, and I wrestled it flat onto the pages of a book. Hmm. And it's important to carry it forward. Yes, I think, I believe that. Denise Chong, I want to thank you so much for joining me on Upon Reflection, a fascinating book, The Concubine's Children. Thanks thank you. again. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.